everyone, Blue Goblin here. Thank you for joining me here for my comic book review for this week of March 2014. Got a lot of books to cover. We've got some DC and Independent and Marvel. We're going to go through DC first. We're going to start with Batman 66, issue number 9. Uh, Zelda's Great Escape plus The Butler did it. Uh, Jeff Parker, great job with the writing. I'm not going to lie, though, the first story with uh, Zelda the Great, it didn't really do anything for me at all. It's just, it was basically a story in which Zelda was obsessed with how Batman and Robin escaped their infamous traps and everything like that. And that's pretty much all it was. Plus, um, Dick Grayson's date is a hostage in this, in this story, and she comes across as very, very ditzy and very, very stupid. Uh, it's just, just didn't do anything for me. The second story, though, with the butler did it involving Alfred's cousin and everything, was actually a lot better. I thought it was a phenomenal story, very well told, some decent character development, honest to God, honest to God goodness. Um, the second story was much, much better than the first. If you're just a casual fan of this series, I would probably say skip this issue, but if you like to collect it, and if you want to add this to your collection, then by all means, go right ahead, but I'm warning you, the, the first story with Zelda was a bit of a disappointment, but the second story was really good. Moving on to Batman and Aquaman, number 29, The Hunt for Robin Begins, Peter Tomasi, Patrick Gleason. This was a phenomenal issue. This was good. We got to see some awesome stuff here but with, with Batman and Arthur. Uh, you know, uh, Ra's al Ghul has taken the bodies of Talia and Damien, and he's planning on resurrecting them for his purposes. Of course, Bruce is going to want his son's body back, you know, and everything like that. But to see the stuff that Batman goes through in here, and to see the stuff that Aquaman witnesses, and to see the th just both Bruce and Arthur to have this thirst to just want to just get their hands on Ra's al Ghul in the worst possible way, and it was written so so very very well. A couple of uh, kinds of moments in here, and it was very very well put together. The artwork was fantastic. The storyline, the storytelling flowed beautifully. I'm not going to ruin anything. This was a good read. Very nicely done. One of the best issues out of this series in a while. The stuff with Two-Face was good, but it is really getting good right now. Hopefully, it continues to be this good. <sighs> Moving on to Batwoman number 29. The Under the Spell of Nocturna. This cover's a little bit misleading. This doesn't actually happen in here. Mark and Draco, Jason Masters, and uh, um, and Jeremy Juan, y'all did a fantastic job with this. You know, uh, Kate and Maggie have another conversation about what's going on in their relationship. Please, DC, I am begging you, for the love of God, do not break this couple up. They work so well together. They look like a legitimate couple that you want to see stay together. So please, for the love of God, you homophobic motherfuckers, do not break them up. Um, but it's basically Kate just wanting to get her hands on Wolf Spider, and Wolf Spider kind of comes off a little, just a little, I mean, I mean just a little Deadpool-ish, just a little bit. He's, he's a good fighter, he's got some really good skills, but he's also a bit of a smart ass, and I, I like that in a, in a Batwoman villain. You know, get away from some of the, get away from most of the series, and make some of the villains try to look like they may be a little bit of fun to beat up on a little bit. Very, very well done. The action here was very good. The drama in here was really good, and all I'm gonna say is the cliffhanger in here was a little bit on the dun 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 style, and. Uh, things ain't looking so well for Kate in the end, but this was a solid read. I enjoyed it. The cover, though, is misleading. This doesn't really happen, but what you get in here is something good. Very well done. Mr. Andreco, good job. And to the artist, thumbs up. Y'all also did a great job. This was good. Very, very good. Okay. 
Okay. Moving on to Harley Quinn number four. Speaking of fun, Dysfunctional Family. This was incredibly fun. I got a chuckle out of almost everything in here. Just very, very good stuff. You know, Harley is like the beginning in the beginning of the book, she's like putting powder all over herself to make her look make her flesh look more colorful. And she literally powders down her entire body. <laughs> and it's just kind of kind of silly when you think about it. And uh and she uh meets an elderly woman in in a nursing home. That's where she's working at and as a psychiatrist or psychologist or whatever the word is. But she finds out something about this elderly woman and she goes to see this woman's family and that's where I'm going to end it because this was so good and so funny and the twist at the end was so damn good. I'm not going to ruin anything. I'm going to leave it right there and just say pick this book up, read it, enjoy it, get a good laugh out of it. And there's also a moment in here that and I'm sure a bunch of Star Wars nerds are going to get a boner for. Just fantastic stuff in here. Uh, and, uh, and a decent ending too, uh, but the main story is what just kills it for me. I love it. Pure, simple, sweet, fun. Comic books, a lot of the times, need to be fun, and this is a perfect example of a fun read. Harley Quinn number four. Do yourself a favor and pick this book up. It was great. Next up, Red Hood and the Outlaws, number 29. I got this book because of the new creative team. And let me go ahead and take it out right now to see who I credit here. Uh, Will Pfeiffer is the new writer. Pencils by Raphael Sandoval. And the penciling here is really good. Oh, yeah. Look at Corey. Ain't that awesome. I don't know how well the camera picked that up. But this is actually not that bad. This was mu this was much better than some of the past shit that James Tanai and the Fourth did uh, for the previous run. This was actually really good. Uh, you know, Jason and Corey are doing some training outside and Roy's fucking around with some technical stuff inside the sh inside the ship and it gets taken by three beings who I'm assuming one of them might be Tamaranian and you know Roy's tinkering with something that's got like a little bomb inside of it and one of the thugs that stole the ship finds it and it blows him up it blows him up and he's scattered all over the place but he regenerates and reassembles himself and you're like whoa <laughs> okay that's new meanwhile Jason and Corey have got their hands full with a giant lizard and they try to extract information out of him but all in all, this was actually not that bad. This was actually pretty good. The new creative team did a decent job for their first go at it. Still, the only thing that bothers me is Roy, Arsenal. I still don't give a fuck about him. Get rid of that stupid green trucker hat on a red, on a red jumpsuit. I mean, he looks like he was yanked straight out of the 90s. He still does. I don't know why that bothers me. I can't explain why that bothers me. It just looks so out of place. His look just looks incredibly dated to me, and it just doesn't look like it fits in a modern-day comic book. But other than that, the storytelling in here was actually pretty damn good. I actually enjoyed that issue. Moving on to Dynamite with the Spider number 18. This is the final issue. David Liss and Ivan Rodriguez, I want to thank y'all from the bottom of my heart and to everybody who worked on this series, who originally worked on it, who, you know, everybody who did everything they did for this series, I want to thank you for giving me such goodness. This was an awesome series and I'm sad to see it go, but man, does this run go out with a bang. Quite literally, this was fucking awesome. Spider, he's still on the run. He's still a wanted fugitive. But there are certain twists that happen in here that I literally did not see coming. He gets reunited with some of the butt, some of the other, with some of the people that worked with him who helped him out on missions and everything like that. It's a and how that reunion happens was really good, and I'm not going to spoil that. But I love how he uh, dealt with Gas Mask. 
I love how he dealt with that, and I love how he dealt with his bomb threat and everything. I'm not going to ruin it because I, I just loved it so much. But the icing on the cake for this issue was what he did with that red-headed bitch who took over his company, Wentworth Industries. She just wants to be called Norma, so we'll just call her Norma. But I call her red-headed bitch. But we'll call her Norma. What he does with Norma in here, oh my god. Just, woo. This right here, this issue, was a statement. Don't fuck with the spider. Pure and simple. This was such an incredible ending to this run. Just fantastic stuff. If any of these people do another series of the spider again, I need to know about it so I can get on board with it. This was awesome please pick this up please read it and please enjoy it you won't regret it i promise you <sighs> moving on to marvel we're starting with daredevil number one yeah yeah i'm not gonna go through the joke again but you know how marvel just loves number one issues <laughs> but mark wade's still making that magic work this was great I'm not going to lie, even though it's Mark Magic Wade, I wasn't expecting much from this issue. I was going into it thinking it was going to be introducing the new status quo for Daredevil. Seeing Matt Murdock set up, set up shop in San Francisco, see where he's living, see what he's up to when he's not being Daredevil, and setting up the first adventure for Daredevil. That's what I thought I was going to get, and then I read this. Wow, was this really good. This went way above my expectations, and it just blew me away on how good it was. Fantastic stuff. Daredevil is on the run in this issue from a couple of uh, thugs on gliders who are going after this little girl. But we don't know why they're after this little girl until nearly the end of the issue. And when we find out what the purpose of this little girl is, whoa, shit gets real. Nicely done. And I'm not going to say anything else about it. This was great. Fantastic stuff. And the ending. What the fuck was with that ending? Fantastic. Mark Wade. I love you, man. This was great shit. Fantastic stuff. An awesome uh, introduction, reintroduction to a run on Daredevil. Fantastic. Moving on to Ms. Marvel number two. Uh, this was basically more or less uh, Karima uh, coming to grips with what she is, and she's an inhuman. And what this issue basically is is her getting uh, her um, coming across what exactly her powers are, and then deals with shape shifting. She can shrink. She can grow. She can grow certain parts of her body. She has strength, apparently, and that's pretty much all this issue was. It's that and her constantly butting heads with her family because of how they, because of what their lifestyles are and because of how they want her to be when she grows up and everything. It, everything is there that you could ask for in a, in a good comic book. Some, uh, not very heavy on the action, but the storytelling in here was really good. The drama in here was also really, really good. But it's got that, it just has that kind of charm to it where you have a new character, a new hero, if you will, discovering just what their powers are and what makes them click and what, and she's learning how to use her powers and she's basically learning all by herself. And not to mention dealing with her family drama and everything, this girl has got a lot of weight on her shoulders and it makes for good storytelling. That's pretty much all this was. There was hardly any action if, there was, yeah, there was barely any real big action in here at all i mean it was just very nicely done it's pretty much all there is to it a simple a simple and short little read that ended up being a lot of fun not that bad i know this is a back issue but i'm gonna talk about it anyway new warriors number two christios and marcus two great job this is good the evolutionaries as they're calling it as they're called is going around attacking mutants or you know and in, uh, in humans and everything we don't know exactly what their purpose is right now but it's still nice to see what 
could be the cause of this new team of new warriors coming together and forming up. We get to see how what went down between uh, Scarlet Spider, Mockingbird, and uh, Water Snake, as she's called in this run. We can see what's going on with uh, with Sun Girl, who she helps in here, and uh, Speedball and Justice. We can see what they do in here, and I love what one of their lines in here was. You know, they go to Avengers Mansion, they find out more about the Evolutionaries. And then they find out there's something going on somewhere in the city, and there's no Avengers around, and and I love this. Vic, uh, Justice asks uh, so, uh, Speedball, he says, hey, you feel like being an Avenger? He says, no, I'm a warrior. Fucking awesome! That statement right there was the key moment of the book. This is not the Avengers. These are the new warriors. Hashtag deal with it. This was great. That one statement just lit a fire out of my, under my ass and just made me love it. That was good. It's sometimes it's the little things in a comic book that really gets you to love the overall story, and that was a great example of it. The action in here was good, even when the action was concerning misunderstandings. Fantastic stuff. I loved it. This was great. Uncanny X Men number one or number 19 point now this is basically dick summers or should we call him racer x it's racer x's uncanny x-men versus shield and this is not this is no false advertisement this is real stuff yeah and what happens here is that the x-men that racer x threw out good old dick summers the mutant he threw out hijack has been infiltrated by Shield and his own house, and he's they're like, where is where is Cyclops? You know, where is Dick Summers? You know, where does he live? Where's his base of operations? We hacked everything you own. We're gonna find out one way or another. And meanwhile, Racer X and his team of X Men have been uh, called out to a new mutant being spotted somewhere in Chicago, but it turns out it was a ruse. They were set up. A bunch of sentinels attack them, but here's the catch. These new sentinels that attack them, they have something equipped on them that actually blocks out most of their mutant powers. You know, Magic cannot tell Magic can't teleport, Emma can't turn into diamond, Cyclops can't fire a big blastic optic range, but for some reason Eva was still able to use her time ball. But Magic has a way around these Sentinels, not with her mutant power, but with something else. And I'm not going to ruin that. It was really good. But then again, Cyclops does something in here that completely villainizes him. He lets open, once they deal with the threat that's blocking their powers, he lets open a big blast of optic energy. And I'm like, you dumb son of a bitch! You're opening up a big blast that you know you can't fucking control. You're putting innocent lives at risk for what? To make your sorry ass look better? Fuck you, Dick Summers. You reckless, overhyped piece of shit. This is still a series that is painting Dick Summers Cyclops as a pure cut villain. I don't give a fuck what his message is, what he believes he stands for, the shit he's been doing in this in this series has been completely fucking reckless. It's putting him out there in the open. It's painting him to look more like a villain than a hero. You might as well put a purple helmet and cape on him and start fucking calling him Magneto. Other than that, this was good. Moving on to Wolverine and the X-Men number two. Jason Latour, Muhammad uh, Asrar, uh, sorry if I butchered those names. This was also really good. We get to see what was up with that phone call at the end of the first issue with the Phoenix emblem showing up everywhere. It's the Phoenix Corporation. And they keep asking the question, will you rise? And there's some some more doubt from Quentin Choir. He, he actually goes to check this place out. And he gets distracted by what he calls sexy nuns. And he comes across a character, I'm not going to ruin everything, but he comes across a character who goes into Choir's mind, and he goes into Logan's mind near the end of the book. Choir sees a lot of shit that obviously spooks him. Logan sees a lot of shit. Something he saw spooked him. 
And I love the, the conversation, the heavy dramatic conversation between Storm and Wolverine in the middle of the book. It was very nicely done. Uh, the action we got in here was really good, but it's mostly the storytelling and the drama that really sold this book. Very, very well done. And I still love the little bamps that go around drunk off their ass on whiskey. It's just funny shit. But this was very nicely done. We get to see some interesting character development for Idy in here. Very good. But something has fucked with Quentin Quire up here. And it's fucked also with Logan up here as well. And the shit that's said in here, I don't want to give it away because it was really good. Makes you wonder, just where the hell are they going with this? It's that good a storytelling. All in all, a fun read, very nicely done. And we're ending it with X-Men number 12, Brian Wood. Uh, this is another two story. This is another story split. The first half deals with you know Storm, Monet, and Psylocke dealing with Archaea and her sisterhood, if you will. And uh, this felt kind of abrupt, actually, how they dealt with Archaea. And I'm like, really? All this talk about how dangerous Archaea was and how they dealt with her in this issue, I'm like, okay, that was kind of sort of anticlimactic but still very well put together. As powerful and as dangerous Archaea is, we get to find out very quickly that uh, she doesn't really truly have a hold on anybody. Lady Deathstrike, Lady Deathstrike turned on her in the last issue, and in this issue, more people turned on her, but how they did and what caused them to do it, I'm not going to give it away. And I'm not going to give away how they dealt with Archaea, because I, you know, I don't. Even though I kind of felt like it was a little anticlimactic, I still don't want to spoil it. I still think it was nicely told, but I was just expecting a little bit more. And the second half of the book deals with how Jubilee and the, and her gang dealt with the Mark One Sentinels that were also controlled by Archaea. Nicely done. I'm glad that Jubilee's okay. Everybody dealt with the Sentinels very nicely. Very nicely, and we may be seeing a. Uh, a relationship blooming between two characters. You know, Roxy uh, opens up to... Uh, oh, hell. I'm terrible with some of these names for the younger for the younger mutants. Hang on. But Roxy, she's the one of the metal-skinned mutants. It's like she felt embarrassed. The girl that she's chasing, she's like, she's like, look at me. I'm ugly. My skin is like hard and potentially dangerous. Plus, I'm the only lesbian at the school. I'm lonely. Her, she's going after Cecily. She says, I don't know. I thought you might understand. And she says, so let's go out, Roxy. But just talk to me and ask me like a human being. I don't know. Weird creepy notes left on my door. What's up with that? So there may be a, a budding relationship between two girls at the Jean Grey school and I'm like okay let's see where they go with this what kind of drama can they get out of this or is this just gonna be okay they're a, le they're a lesbian couple just they're over there somewhere you know what could be fo they could make a storyline out of this I'd like to see where this goes especially when it's from two younger mutants who could possibly be future X-Men later on down the line I don't know I'm a sucker for relationships in comic books maybe it's because I'm in a relationship with a great woman who knows but all in all, this was really good. I'm glad Jubilee's okay, considering what happened to her in the last issue with her turning into mist and everything. But she's fine. But it's just the stuff with Archaea was just a little anticlimactic, but still very good. Just because something is anticlimactic doesn't mean it's going to be god-awful. I expected a lot more, but for what I got, I was happy. Not... Yeah, you know, I was a little disappointed, but still I enjoyed the read. This was, this was a decent read nonetheless. Well, that's all I got for this for this week of books, everybody. I know there's a lot of books I missed out on, like the Superior Spider-Man Annual. Marvel is trying their, their best to pump five extra dollars out of that Superior Spider-Man franchise, and they didn't get it from me, not this week. Maybe later on down the line I'll probably pick it up, but I just didn't feel like doing it. I didn't feel like spending five extra bucks, and I know I missed out on the, the Green Lantern New Guardians book as well as other titles, but hey... I'm running low on funds right now, and as you saw on as you saw on my feed, if you follow me on Twitter, you would know that I recently tried to go for a job, go for a job interview, and I got 
uh, and the manager no-showed on me, so, oh well, it is what it is. Uh, thanks for watching this review, everybody. Don't forget to subscribe. Please go check out my Blue Goblin X channel for some independent comic goodness. I uh, got some more videos coming out for there. Don't forget about Arkham Asylum Studio with me and my girlfriend Jennifer. Don't forget Dark Avenger Inc. Plus. I'm getting ready to do review Cataclysm, the main story. I may review Cataclysm X-Men, but I'm going to review Cataclysm, the main story. And I want to review Fantastic Four number two for that channel. Uh, and don't forget my bro, the Mount Vernon kid, and uh, send him some love and subscribe to his channels. Don't forget Mark and Chloe at Fast Stack of Comics, Deadpoolzilla, Brandon Hex, my old, my old buddies from YouTube. Uh, yeah, and uh, Deadpoolzilla, I too am excited about Incredibles 2, but couldn't care less about Cars 3. You're right. <laughs> uh, follow me on Twitter, at BlueGoblin01, or on Tumblr, BlueGoblin.tumblr.com. Look for me on Pinterest. And uh, I guess that's it. <laughs> Thanks for watching. And until next time, as always, folks, I'll see y'all later.